Uh, Anita will also play that. By the way, we are live, Hello. everyone. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Are you feeling the spicy? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's spicy. Gross. Yes, because we have a guest. Yay. <laughs> So everyone, like, you know, it's great to meet everyone now. And then I think that you notice that we have someone, a guest, the first guest, the uh, adopted Despise Girls also, right? <laughs> For the year, the first guest of the year is Nandini. So be give a big clap for Nandini. Yay. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Nandini, do you want to introduce yourself? Your amazing self. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Nandini. Uh, I live in Bangalore, uh, India, and I work with an organization called uh, IT for Change. So we are a not-for-profit organization that is engaged in research, policy, advocacy, and institutional capacity building and field practice at the intersections of digital technologies and social change. Uh, working on the uh, working with the objectives of furthering gender equality, social justice, and development justice. The organization was born in the year 2000 when there was a lot of optimism about the digital revolution. And the idea was that without getting into a techno solutionist mode, how is it that we can adopt an appropriate digitalization to further a gender just and equitable world order? So that was the objective of the organization. Uh, and we work on various facets of understanding uh, digitalization, the way in which it is recrafting social and economic uh, norms and systems and looking at what should be a progressive response to this. Thank you so much, Nandini. And we are very happy to tell the audience that IT for Change is uh, a very visible, very admirable, very uh, head peering organization on issues on technology, feminism, really hardcore feminism globally. And uh, they're also one of our dearest friends in the global challenge in trying to make connections with structural agendas and uh, feminism. So this is, it's like very exceptional organizations because given that the issue of technology touches upon many things like vaccines, uh, intellectual property rights, uh, environmental impacts, social impacts, etc. Their, their work has been really um, an example on how a feminist agenda can really go and challenge all of the barriers. And they're the leading ag agents in so many global processes at the moment. So we are very grateful that Nandini is here and that we've met in so many processes so far. Uh, they have been leading a network of feminist organizations around the world to try to, to map all of the interlinkages that we as feminists need to be concerned with when it comes uh, to technologies. But we'll talk about maybe that in another session or you let us know, Nandini, uh, they, 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 will, they will also come up with that announcement at its own time. But we're very excited uh, to have you here, Nandini, because of the CSW, we had our first session at two weeks ago with the Despise Girls this year. And we were saying that the Commission of the Status of Women was coming, that the topic this year was very hardcore in the issues of digital technologies. And we needed to bring an expert to tell us why is it so important to talk about it. So we're so happy to, to have you here, Nandini. And I think while well, Rina and Nandini have been uh, knowing each other for a long time because they work with, in the Asia Pacific region, you will have to tell us all about it, but it's the regional work that you do as well. That is so important. It's not only about the global, it's how to go back to the territories. But I also think uh, Tete and Nandini haven't met before, which is like, what is happening there? There's a clash in the universe in this session now <laughs> with a few of your meetings. Yeah, that's why I said I'm meeting Nandini for the first time. And I'm super excited yeah. because I'm one of those people who are, um, let's say, technologically challenged. 
Same and here. in a way, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to Nandini educating all of us non-techies, no, about what the you know, what's the issue behind all of this talk around digitalization, digital economy, digital infrastructure. It all sounds so exciting and high-tech, futuristic. Why should we be concerned and why should we resist all of these attempts? So Nandini, nice to meet you. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, and also just just also to note again, because responding to what Amelia said, yes, IT for change is really, really feasible, strong organization that really work consistently, you know, uh, on the issue of uh, digitalization. Uh, we have been, you know, Nandini and I, I don't know, when was that that we know each other, Nandini? I think that back then when we are talking about the issue of uh, SDG 2030 agenda, and then uh, yeah. uh, we are actually uh, IT for Change have this uh, a very uh, strong uh, articles and then also paper on development justice in uh, in the digital paradigm. So we are talking when we are talking about digital justice, we cannot not talk about development justice also. So it's amazing. Uh, so yeah, so I think that I will give it to Nandini. Nandini, I think that that, that asked you uh, some of the trigger question, right? <laughs> like why, why digitalization is a very important issue that we need to really look out right now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first of all, let me say thank you for this like big, op uh, you know, opportunity to be part of this uh, conversation. And it, it is like, you know, very, very nice because with AP APWLD and with Emilia and with the campaign of campaigns, you know, it's great to reconnect with old friends and great to make new friends also and connect with it uh, directly and with everyone out there in the show whom I can't see here. But I think like, you know, we should be in touch and looking forward to more learning and collaboration from everybody in the room. Uh, I think that uh, uh, at some level, uh, it is becoming increasingly evident to all of us. And I want to make a very big caveat there that most of us at IT for Change are not techies. We are development practitioners or like, you know, uh, a feminist activist or like people who are from a non-technology background and concerned about social justice, gender equality and development politics. And we chose to work with technology because it's not just a tool, but it's actually a structural force that is reconstituting economic, social and the political systems of our times. And as feminists who are invested in economic justice, just like all of you, we are concerned about the new face that capitalism is acquiring today at the global level. And as Rina and Emilia were saying, it's important that our analysis is not at an astroturf level, but very localized. But at the same time, we recognize the interconnections between global structural movements and local developments. So digitalization is something that changes the scale at which economic, social, and political processes work. So we live in a network scale world where the connections between the micro level and macro level are happening in ways that we are not able to see uh, before. And that's why we must pay attention to digitalization. And as uh, the acceleration of digitalization post COVID has revealed, unfortunately, the trajectory of how the evolution of frontier digital data and AI technologies has happened has been shaped by big tech or powerful transnational corporations. Some of them are internet companies. Others are actually traditional companies in the pharma or agri or other sectors who have discovered the data technologies. And we also have this new class of uh, actors like the asset, uh, the investment uh, companies like uh, BlackRock, right? The investment funds and hedge funds who are investing in digitalization. And uh, this is wh where speculative finance is making its like new game and, uh, and like, you know, hedging its bets. And this means that 
today the way digitalization is getting shaped it is deepening the geographies of inequality and it is deepening intersectional social structural divides and we must actually be careful in our response because every time there is a technological revolution putting back the genie in the bottle is not always an option right occasionally we might feel very visceral about it like in the case of let's say behavioral mining on social media where we want to say that this kind of development should not happen that is fine but we may not be able to say we reject data and ai technologies altogether because they bring some new affordances so which means that we must learn to reclaim our imaginaries from capitalism and rethink in a feminist way how to appropriate these new technologies and uh, that is why i think as feminists whether we come from a technology background or not we should apply the traditional tools of structural analysis that traditions of feminism like southern feminism have taught us and apply it to this new phenomenon wow nandini you started really strong <laughs> why we last week we were saying several times we need to bring nandini to the show to this live sessions and just have her here and explain everything to us you're you're bringing so many things and just want to say that from from the outside I, i have been to new york last year and that not only in the feminist uh, field but also in the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, people are saying, yes, we need to reach the digital gap. It relates with inequalities because not everybody has access to internet. So we need to promote internet everywhere. And we just need to, uh, in the case of women, we need to include women in the, in the technology field, in the digital world. But to us in the financing for development world, in the women's working group, uh, in the campaign, campaign etc., us as the Spice Girls, we've always fought against monopolies. And you know, this side of concentration of wealth and what's the harm of all of these uh, multilateral companies in, around the world. So there is a mismatch between what people is asking for in asking everybody should have access to internet or women should reach the digital divide and just reach the place where men are as opposed to who will be delivering the service, who will be then be promoted to, to, to profit from those measures. And uh, uh, to add another layer, when we're always insisting we should have private services, which we will end up with this, this session with an announcement. Um, and the state seems to be bound to all of these, uh, the manipulation, the, the misuse, Uh, even the tax avoidance, the tax abuse of all of these corporations, uh, it seems like states are helpless. So just wanted to give this that when Nandini, just as a first question on my end, when everybody says out there, oh, let's have an inclusion of women to the agenda, what is the feminist analysis from a structural point of view to that ask when, when you're coming in IT for change? What are what is the vision that you foresee in in a post-capitalistic world as you're saying oh that that is also wanting to to talk yeah nandini of course you're our wait wait we, we said our session is trying to talk you know trying to unpack a lot of these complex concepts and issues but i think our level is already there flying high up so let's try to break it down a little bit emilia if you please before we before we ask nandini to answer your super super important question maybe we could try to to break it down make it more concrete no um how has this digital economy digitalization changed the way societies the way people interact with each other the way countries interact and what are some examples like for me when i say when i see digital economy i can only think about um netflix uber <laughs> are they part of the digital economy or even google no so maybe we can try to Um, baby steps first, uh, trying to understand what this digital economy monster is all about before we uh, bam, 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 <laughs> try to uh, critique it from, uh, you know, the capitalist framework, etc., etc. I hope you don't mind. 
Thank you. Agree, agree. <laughs> Go ahead, Nandini. Mm, fair um, enough. <laughs> uh, I think that, you know, um, to understand uh, this term, it's just that every time capitalism will come up with new jargon. But the moment we start asking the basic questions, we it all unravels in a very simple way, right? So let's like try to ask the questions in this way. Every time we want to assess capitalism, we ask the question of what is market power today? Who holds it and what determines it, right? So when we are looking at the digitalization of the economy, we can just start with a simple task and I won't give the answer. So this is homework for all of us and I'm sure all of us already know the answer. When you look at the list of the top 10 companies by market capitalization today, who are there? What drives their valuation, right? We don't have industrial corporations today. We have a new animal, which we at IT for Change like to call the intelligence corporation because the business value is determined by the ability to use social commons of data to derive an intelligence advantage and control entire market ecosystems. We will see that sometime around the early 2000s, after the when everyone was enamored by the magic of the open web and the internet, the mobile revolution came along and we saw the rise of a new uh, business model called the platform firm, right? And what shapes the platform firm? They are able, able, uh, able to provide networked infrastructures of interaction that, that are able to connect different classes of economic and social actors. And then what do they do? They kind of hold the user base captive. And not only are they a traditional broker exclusively gaming these interactions, they extract data from these interactions in order to generate the intelligence which will help game these interactions in ways that maximize their profit uh, advantage and extend this particular like you know advantage to different and related sectors and sometimes even unrelated sectors today in the paper i read that amazon is now buying like you know amazon cargo air cargo uh, airline right and uh, recently uh, we had visited thailand for a program and then at that point you look at the uh, a, a super app called grab these super apps are not there in indian market for example what does the super app of grab do if you open it you actually see that this one platform has enormous stickiness because right from buying food to kind of like you know transporting from one place to another and to managing a variety of interactions you can spend your whole life in the walled garden of that platform pretty much or what is facebook trying to achieve through its now contested merger of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, right? What's really happening there? So platforms try to become the environments in which you will live your entire life and you will uh, do all your social interactions. I also want to talk about another point which we, even at it for change we struggle to remind ourselves about it, which is that usually when you talk about platforms, you think of consumer-facing platforms, right? Like internet platforms, like these digital labor platforms, or like platforms in ride-hailing, where there are user interactions or labor market connections. But uh, the industrial internet and the platforms that are there in things like agriculture, where there may be tractors of John Deere, you know, connected with data from weather and soil health and moisture mapping devices, they are also powerful, right? Like you have companies like Monsanto having things like uh, Climate View and Field View, and for instance, even Microsoft is into things like this. What 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 is happening there? There is a different way in which, like, rather than invest in land and other fixed assets, corporations are investing in the data assets and intelligence assets and the future value of data, which is difficult to predict because the data's future value is unknown because of the phenomenal million odd downstream uses it could potentially have, right? That is really what is gaming the speculative capitalism uh, today. Uh, and this is why the monopolies are much more difficult to tackle. Usually when we encounter this problem, people say, break up big tech, right? That's a very popular uh, solution. 
But even if you break up big tech, how do you kind of deal with the structural problem of the centralization of data advantage? Because you don't want Facebook to be replaced by another monopoly, right? Or more than the global south, policymakers often think that they will build alternative digital economies, which are not true alternatives, but just means that instead of having Google or a US corporation or a Chinese corporation, you mimic that model and like mimic that platform capitalist model. I would also encourage everyone to read this book by Nick Shrenchek called Platform Capitalism, where he very lucidly and in simple language explains this phenomenon. It's a great read and I would really encourage you all to uh, check it out. Uh, and I think that the, this is the problem of market power today, which is unique. And to tackle it, what becomes like, you know, very difficult and what makes the problem worse is that there is no economic governance regime that is adequate to tackling these data and intelligence monopolies. We don't have any idea on how to govern the shared social resource of data. Sometimes we come up with very partial and inadequate solutions like treat data as private property. But this forgets the point that we are not talking about individual data points, which are, of course, non rivalrous because personal information could be used in myriad different ways. We are talking about a unique combination of a material intangible infrastructure, which is a networked infrastructure that carries in it certain data points and relationalities, right? The platforms own the pipes through which you mine intelligence from data, which is why people say, you can't recreate an Uber because the first mover owns it all, right? How do you break this advantage? Now, this is a problem we haven't like satisfactorily cracked. Then we have to think of like very, very innovative and radical models. Is it possible to think of public platform infrastructures? Because exactly like once upon a time, people you know stood up and said that highways and certain other public infrastructure, which are core infrastructural goods for societies, cannot be held in private hands. And we had this movement in the US itself in the 19th century against in the Gilded Age against the railroad barons, right? So there is, so now this solution is not like something where, you know, we are going with a very, very, uh, uh, very, very blunt solution, like saying nationalize everything. No, like someone very, uh, you know, succinctly once said, Making infrastructures public should not be, uh, you know, confused with the project of nationalization. That is, that may be one route. But making uh, public infrastructures is that there is public financing and there is democratic control, so alternative digital economies can emerge. The last point I want to make here is that today in the digital policy and <laughs> discourse, there is no space to talk about these solutions because. Uh, there is a very strange thing happening in the digital policy space, which I think everyone here with their different experiences in the UN system will say has spread to every particular dimension of UN policy making, and it's a contagion. And this contagion is corporate multi-stakeholderism. There is an idea that corporations can sit at the table with policymakers and uh, stakeholders can talk to each other uh, in uh, on an equal footing without ever getting into the question of representational legitimacy because governments are supposed to be elected and the democratic right and governments have a basis to represent their peoples whose interests are corporations representing and if you bring people of unequal power at the table, what is the process that you will do to prevent elite capture of the discourse? We are not able to answer this satisfactorily. And this results in very undesirable outcomes, I would say, where uh, at the global digital policy level, after this very famous UN conference called the World Summit on Information Society, which happened in two, between 2003 and 2005, after nearly 20 years later, we are not able to arrive at a satisfactory process to decide the legitimate roles and responsibilities of governments in public policy making or what is it that you are going to do to make digital policy happen and how are you going to balance the interests. And uh, in the new initiatives the UN system is undertake undertaking, such as like, you know, the UN Secretary General's Roadmap for Global Digital Cooperation and the new process that he has launched out his office has launched of the UN Global Digital Compact. It's not very clear how this problem is going to be fixed. 
And this is why we cannot afford to give up. And all of us as feminists must start engaging with these processes. And in the next like seven or eight months, go to every consultation. I know Emilia was at a consultation yesterday for this. And I encourage everybody to sign up and go for this. Well, I'm so happy that I ask you a very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> to turn it down on the game, pow, pow, pow. <laughs> and you're, you're one of us, Nandini, definitely. <laughs> Welcome to the Spice Girls Club. <laughs> that was that was really uh, really something. And I uh, just want to say, um, you um, you brought up so many things uh, from the from the history to the current challenges, and also. As you say, what are the some options of, of being radical, right? In in coming up with our solutions and maybe shine away and going off the grid may not be the structural solution, also because many people depend on that, right? And that's also something to, to be mindful. Um, but um, I just wanted to say we are in the context of uh, CSW. So you brought up many United Nations process, processes, and we like that because we in the Despised Girls, we're trying to explain people who are not advocates, what is it like the world of the UN, why everybody should be mindful about it. You're inviting us as feminists to join into these discussions on the digital compact, etc. And now we said uh, for the women out there and feminists out there, the CSW is coming uh, in March. And uh, we know that you have been, IT for Change have been really strong also. First, in participating in the expert group meetings, coming up with expert, um, expert papers, but also now in trying to send out messages to member states and to feminist advocates as to, in all of the complexity you have introduced here, how are we going to relate to, to those negotiations? Why, wh what would be our main ask in, in all of this, this um, landscape that you have portrayed to us? Yeah, uh, I think that's a very uh, critical uh, question, uh, Emily, and we all need to jointly figure it out. So uh, first, I want to go back to one point you were saying earlier, where you said that, you know, there's a dominant paradigm in policy making, which thinks that including women in the digital order is about inclusion as connectivity through bridging the gender digital divide, right? And I think that in the a CSW document in the outcome document and the draft text that was released by the Bureau on 30th Jan, we see this problem like, you know, throughout. The inadequacy of the analysis is that we do not seem to understand the fact that inclusion in an extractive order is adverse inclusion that will work against women's rights and gender justice, right? So uh, I think that, you know, this is what we need to change in the CSW outcome document, because as a particular consensus and which has like soft discursive power within the UN system and in the year of the uh, global uh, digital compact, there is a value into getting a structural perspective into it. And here I would just like to talk about like, you know, three simple asks I feel if like, you know, whoever of us is involved in it, engaged in it, talking to negotiators, three simple asks are li like as follows. So the first one is about the CSW document, I think in the paragraphs uh, 37HH and 37II, they actually contain references to what the negotiators expect, like, you know, the global digital compact to deliver. So there is a CSW outcome, uh, the expectation from the global digital compact. And here, the language needs to be strengthened for two things. Rather than speak about you know, putting gender into human rights, due diligence and impact assessments in the use of new frontier data and AI technologies, which is important, of course, that is not like to be dismissed. The language needs to be made more robust to say that in the global digital compact, we need to be holding corporations accountable for women's human rights violations and the encroachment of women's human rights. So this is extremely critical because such a demand is essential. And there is another demand in 37II where we are actually thinking that, you know, the document must uh, talk about how data and AI should be commonsified. We should not be calling for 
a global data commons like the language in the documents currently seems to suggest because at first glance it seems very uh, progressive and very attractive to say let us govern data as a global commons but the problem is that when you have an unequal international order which tete was also pointing out earlier in her question if you think there is a global data commons which is completely open by default and it is a public good technically which means it, any data from any nation can be taken by companies from everywhere else for public good innovation we know what, what happens next right so the point is that we want to endorse the agenda of commonsification of data so that the, the persons from whom the data is taken, the communities from whom the data is taken, have a right to equal participation in the benefits of that data-led innovation, right? And to shape for what it is used. It's not about the fact that there is a global data commons and like lose public private sector partnership trusteeship mechanisms created where I could also share this analysis that we have done at IT for change of how this global data commons debate is playing out in the UN committee on uh, food and food security and nutrition data right where there's an idea that there should be a global food security and nutrition data trust and like you know it's not clear how the trust will be governed. It's not clear, like, you know, how benefits will be equitably shared out of this food security nutrition data exchange that is being set up. And we know what happens there. So we have to be uh, cognizant of this. Uh, the second point is about, you know, the new manifestation of an older agenda, where uh, when we are looking at technology mediated violence, it's absolutely essential to recognize that violence online and its impacts are as real as the impacts like of offline violence so this digital duality where somehow there seems to be like you know a lack of seriousness is in responding to the new forms of virtualized violence that needs to stop and there needs to be like stronger language to talk about that we feel and especially sexist hate and gender disinformation and a strong call out against that is needed and this should be easy to achieve also considering the fact that the UNSG's background document that was an input document to the CSW talked about it though the outcome draft doesn't talk about it in the strong terms so this must be possible to achieve one would think uh, and the third point is about the fact that in the recognition of the precarity that women workers face in gig economy and in the context of automation, uh, there must be this uh, understanding that foundational labor rights must be protected in the gig work context. Yes, there should also be an acknowledgement of the new forms of human rights that we need, workers' data rights. And when you are looking at the right to be protected from algorithmic surveillance at the workplace, when the right against like, you know, unfair treatment because of automated decision making, we need explicit call outs to that. There's also another very strange thing, both in the UNSG background report and in the outcome document language, there is an idea that women should be included in the millions of jobs that are that will emerge the quality and decent jobs that will emerge out of the digital revolution and automation but there is a first level question right is automation and like you know the digital transition really producing those millions of quality decent jobs and is it just that women are not there and everything can be addressed through skill development policies as what the document seems to suggest the digital transition doesn't seem to be going that way right so what is it that we need to do to reclaim it for uh, human development and to actually talk about autonomous pathways to development where we are not reduced in the global south especially to a situation where we have to sign up for programs like let's say the indo-pacific economic framework for prosperity where the us will start advising us on data governance policies and in return our women will get trained to become a ghost work writers and content writers for google and other algorithmic development processes this is not the global future we want to sign up to right so the progressive feminist future has to reject this entire paradigm and uh, i think this is really the struggle and this idea this compromise into an extractivist paradigm that is just like perpetuating injustice without examining its structural roots this is what we need to be talking about and yes again like the final point the final point is all this compromise 
is happening at one level when we start looking at it because there is a crisis of public financing in the UN system, right? The UN is reliant on private financing and multi-stakeholder mechanisms to run its programs. So unless we have a situation where I'm sure many of you are also uh, engaged in the larger summit of the future processes, which we are not so much engaged in as an organization because we work on the narrower area of digital issues. But in the summit of the future processes, if one has to talk about UN reform, then how do you get out of these like global compact type of arrangements and you look at like, you know, robust official development assistance, uh, developed countries have not met their ODA commitments, not even a fraction of it as per the Addis Ababa agenda. Who is going to ask those questions? Okay, so silence means we are pondering also about that question. Uh, Nandini, that's amazing. Um, I thought that that's face, you know, when you're explaining, she also take notes. I think that they that have like several questions later on. But for me, it's like, I think that you, you mentioned a lot of important points, right? And then uh, it's, it's really interesting that now we are in the CSW and then uh, the issue is about the digitalization. I just, uh, and some of the feminist group is, some know about the issue, yeah, and then some doesn't really, some really don't, you know, some look at the issue from the dominant perspective of inclusion, like what you said, right? But some looking at it from the structural issue, including how it will impact, you know, the livelihood of women, right? The, the work of women, that is very, very crucial, I think, when you speak about digitalization and also the future of work, and then how again, it become more, they said, they, they actually selling it, right? That with digitalization, the work become more flexible for women, women able to actually in, be included and participate. And then also the other the other part is also, they, 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 they mentioned that with this digitalization that uh, women can have women economic empowerment, that has been the mantra, you know, <laughs> that yeah, all of that, that we heard all the time about empowerment, right? So my question is that I know that IT for Change has been doing a lot to actually have that kind of consultation with, with the feminist groups and feminist movement in different region. And I want you to tell us a story about that, right? Because you have this amazing, uh, the charta, uh, I forgot now what is, what is, remind me, remind me, okay. Uh, I think that the charta that you have together, that you put together the feminist charta, feminist demand uh, for the, the global compact, right? And then this is something that, come from the different region consultation. And then luckily that time with uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, IT for Change is actually doing it together with APWLD. So I know what's happening in APWLD, yeah, sorry, in, in Asia Pacific region, but not necessarily from the other region. So maybe you can tell us about it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, th thanks about, uh, you know, for that, Rina, because I also wanted to invite everyone here to collaborate on a follow up to that joint effort, which we also partnered with APWLD in. Uh, so I wanted to say that, you know, over 2022, uh, ID for Change uh, and uh, Friedrich Ebert uh, Stifter, FAS, uh, partnered with uh, APWLD in Asia Pacific the Access to Knowledge for Development Center of the American University of Cairo in the MENA region and uh, the Research ICT Africa in the rest of uh, Africa, as in the Sub-Saharan African region and the FES Regional uh, Trade Union uh, Center in the Latin American region, the FES Syndical. So there were a series of consultations with uh, feminist uh, scholars, practitioners, union representatives in the global south. About between 75 to 100 people participated in these workshops or more of dialogues, actually. So the whole idea was to look at like, you know, digitalization from a structural perspective to critically examine the type of issues that Tetet was also talking about earlier than we were all talking about earlier. And then to see when you look at the global governance landscape and there is a global digital compact, what would it mean to actually bring a structural critique of gender justice into the dominant vision and then reclaim it and say, this is what we would like to see as a charter of feminist demands from the global south. 
Now, I want to say that on March 9th at the CSW, there is a launch event for this uh, charter, which has been co-produced by all the organizations I mentioned about and all the people participating in the dialogues. And so look out for that and we will share more information on that soon. But more importantly, there is an official process by which the Office of the Technology Envoy is collecting written comments for the Global Digital Compact. And uh, the online form actually gives like, you know, preference to positions that have been constructed through civil society collaboration and participation. And we were thinking at IT for Change that just like, you know, we have been working with all the groups and looking at like a feminist critique of the charter. We've also been looking at a political economy critique of the charter with other groups. And if we can all collaborate in a way uh, out of everyone who's interested here, if they can just reach us on email or something, if we can co-construct a short position with our basic demands, like Rina said, we could put in a formal input into the charter. And I also open this invite to everybody in the uh, room. Uh, so that, you know, they can just like reach us and then we can all like do something because there is time, though time is short, there's still time to put something together. Uh, and uh, the last thing I wanted to say was that in these, in this charter that we co-constructed uh, with APWLD and with other organizations, there are like three critical uh, demands, which are at the heart. One is about the accountability of transnational digital corporations for human, women's human rights violations, which we already mentioned. And this refers not just to the often like, you know, talked about issue of the accountability of social media corporations for sexist hate and first generation human rights violations, but also the violations of second generation human rights and the right to development in the corporate controlled value chains. So it's important to look at corporate impunity from an integrated and indivisible human rights perspective. The dialogue showed because many people talked about this in the dialogues. The second issue is something that Rina already mentioned. And I think in the consultation that APWLD had convened in the uh, region, about looking at the rights of women workers in the digital economy, this also came up, that we need a new feminist social contract for the digital economy so that it is not built on the unpaid care work of women and that is not the default fallback for states. So if, if we have to change our uh, tax regimes, which is something we learned from our interactions with you, Emilia, over the many years, and like, you know, looking at feministizing the tax justice uh, regime, that becomes even more important in the digital economy because we have to address the base erosion and profit shifting practices of virtualized businesses. And the last demand is something I think we discussed a little bit earlier, which is about commoning the internet and data resources, right? So usually, you know, this is often there's this like idea that the internet should be left alone, otherwise it will get balkanized and, you know, nobody should rule the internet and it should be a stateless place. But what this idea forgets is the Snowden revelations and the control over critical internet resources that the U.S. has had from day one. It's absolute refusal to internationalize the control of ICANN and go through with just a charade of a process a few years back after like, you know, this whole Snowden revelations happened where nothing really changed, though there was a conference like Net Mundial, nothing really changed and internationalization did not happen. But anytime somebody talks about US hegemony over the internet, the bogeyman of splinter net and, you know, you are talking about an axis of evil or state control that kept, keeps on being raised by the dominant camp. So this is something we should watch out. The uh, second point is about the point I spoke about earlier, that we need a global governance regime for data where people's data sovereignty is acknowledged as sacrosanct and nothing is allowed to kind of disturb that, right? And when we think about people's data sovereignty, it starts with the recognition of individual agency autonomy and collective agency and autonomy as well. In the best feminist tradition, which teaches us all to think that we are not unencumbered, atomized individuals, but we are in a social relationality, right? Feminism teaches us that. And that's something we need to bring to the analysis of uh, data sovereignty. So, yeah, so these are the things. And, you know, you can reach us at IT for Change. We can continue to have these conversations. And it would be wonderful to collaborate with all of you and get your 
further ideas so that we are able to do some urgent joint action that is much needed in this space. Wow, thank you so much, Nandini. We're learning a lot, you know, from this session alone. And the way you've been explaining it, so cool, calm, collected. Hmm. We we have to learn from Nandini, you know, the spice girls, because us three were so loud. Wow. <laughs> But Nandini's way of educating us, explaining to us, it's like, oh, mind-blowing, no? Um, many, many questions, but I'm hoping that we could give Nandini like one or two minutes to catch her breath, have a drink. So maybe I'll throw this question to my fellow Despise Girls, no? Um, I was just wondering, is it also an issue for instance in thailand and in mexico that during the time of the pandemic you know in the name of contact tracing we were we were us in the philippines we were forced to write all our details mobile phone numbers in the name of you know contact tracing but then now i get all of these random advertisements text messages on my phone offering me uh, e online, you know, like online cockfights, um, casino, whatever, whatever, <laughs> offering me so many, many. So for me, it's all about the 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 supremacy of the market, no? And I think Nandini has rightly pointed that out. There's nothing really wrong with advancement in technology, etc. But then the way. Things have been on steroids. That's my favorite mantra now. Everything is on steroids. But it's all in the service of the market. Now, has it also been your case, like in Mexico and Rina? How has our... Uh, it's not just an issue of data privacy, no? but Nandini mentioned something about mining and harvesting our information for marketing and capitalistic purposes. Your thoughts on that, the Spice Girls? I'll go first. There's I will exam, give example to two country because I live in two country. Yeah. One is Thailand. Thailand is actually not so digital, right? Which is probably uh, something that is also kind of weird because there's no uh, what what they do is actually they don't have that kind of app to actually show uh, where you are and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But what they ask you to do every time that you go to the mall or something, you know, or to public spaces, you need to manually write your number and, and yeah, it's manual. Yeah, it's manual. Really, it's manual. And then they will call you one by one. If, for instance, that you happen to be in one store in the same time that they have like COVID uh, case and et cetera, et cetera. In Indonesia, it's a different thing. In Indonesia, you need to have that app that you call, they call Peduli Lindungi, and then you cannot access any building or any places without putting that app, right? And then they can trace you, they can know whether that you are in the risk zone, whether that you're not in the risk zone, you know, all of those stuff. You, they will know if you actually meet someone before that is actually uh, got COVID and et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of also, in, in terms of surveillance, and then all, um, at least that's from what I felt in Indonesia, it's more, you know, kind of, kind of, I, I felt, I, I felt it more, it's kind of more risky. Yeah, I don't know about Mexico, Amelia, do you have that kind of app or tools? Yeah. I'm going to be a disruptive here. I'm going to bring yeah. another issue before <laughs> the time, because I see that we only have 10 minutes. Okay. The issues that we are concerned with, besides what you have added, all of you already, is that there is also this trend for rural women, for women in communities, elder population, etc. That governments say, "Oh, we're gonna give them access to digital banks, right? Like with their apps, and we're gonna make some bank transferences and stuff." And to me, that's really re disruptive in terms of local economies because many people 
are going through processes of non-monetized economy. They survive through other means, especially in the rural uh, spaces, right? And when you add the issue on, you have to join a bank and make it more, more portable, you're financializing a dimension of life that wasn't there for the purpose and profit of the large corporations again, and bank, in this case, the financial uh, system. And I find that very problematic. And again, you and women partnering with all of these actors, these evil actors, it's like getting promoting rather the benefit of these huge banks rather than promoting what what is in the benefit of women. And they call it women empowerment as well. And we found it very problematic, especially the disruption of a of a entire let us say dynamic of local economies and they're bringing and then they're really trying to impose in a very uh, d disturbing way uh, local dynamics in which women are actually uh, now forced to enter these financialized ways of living so that was one element and the other that uh, in dealing with climate issues the amount of massive carbon emissions with the mining of data, especially related to the Bitcoin economy, it's really obscene. They just put all of these machines to extract, extract, extract data and to generate and generate more algorithms, et cetera. And it's nonstop. And th these are like massive storehouses uh, and huge terrains just devoted to that. And so I think also, that is the the hidden and the dark part of the web right not in the virtual platform for, but for in this real life that people is not seeing and they think oh everything will go virtual but but the virtual is upholds in a material world and that is impacting the the, the biodiversity integrity and the and the climate change process because of course we need more mining of rare minerals to feed into all of these infrastructure for the digital economy. And then that will go back again to the harming and destruction of the biodiversity systems. So I think uh, this, this invitation that Nandini was making in bringing a structural perspective is really challenging, but I think it's very much needed at the moment when we could fall into, oh, yes, let's include women and let's bridge the digital gap. And it's like, uh, wait a minute, there has to be some some containers and some regulations. Uh, and uh, as I really love what Nandini said about a p political and social pact from which we are starting over, right? So, yeah, I'll leave it there. So anybody of my despised girls or Nandini, who's also a despised girl at the moment, we've welcome you into our club uh who wants to to take a um a shot at any of what has been said already come on be brave <laughs> anyone <laughs> lots of food for thought definitely no uh, yes Nandini, what do you think? What what would be our best? Set? I mean, you will be in New York for CSW, so that's also very, very encouraging to know. What are the plans for CSW? Uh, so uh, at the CSW, uh, like I mentioned, like you know, we are hoping to kind of like you know, feed these inputs about the structural perspective into as wide conversations as uh, possible, and I also think that like you were pointing out earlier uh it is also important for us to track the global digital compact process because at one level since emilia like you were also mentioning in a different context because at the csw the outcome document and what changes are possible and there is a particular room only that is available we must also like you were talking about take forward this uh, issue into examining the digital as a transversal policy issue into the other forums, right? Like you were talking about tax, you were talking about the climate conversation, Dina was talking about the summit of the future and the global digital compact con conversations. And I think that what is 
extremely important and critical is that in the forums and spaces like the Despise Girls, where all of us who are invested in uh, feminist uh, uh, issues and the analysis of gender justice as economic justice, uh, we are able to come up with like, you know, a slow and steady strategy for the next like couple of years or something at this like historical moment of massive UN reform, right? Because a lot of the issues are transversal. We have so many things to learn from each other and learn from history, like you put it. So those are broadly the thoughts. And some of the questions, the very big questions you asked, Emilia, I was just like thinking that we don't have fully the answers, right? Like, for instance, you know, in a very glib way, it is possible to talk about solutions to digital transition as a just digital transition that also accounts for the climate footprint. But when we start breaking down the details and we don't want to end up with greenwashing by big tech, which we are all worried about, what would it really mean, right? And considering that, you know, there is also like a centralized uh, server client paradigm, AI technologies, even if you're talking about edge AI technologies, will that really change the climate footprint? These are answers we don't have at the moment and we are trying to work on those issues and it needs many more minds and many more hands to work on these issues i think yeah, yeah. and uh, patents as well and the reform of the global patents regime sorry go ahead Rina. I no 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 Nancy, sorry i cut you because i suddenly have that many minds. yeah you had a aha moment tell us yeah that that moment of like means yes yes of course many minds but also cross movement you know we need to make it an issue that the movements really uh, care about, right? So for, for us, like for instance, like I think movement building and capacity building is actually a very major component yeah, uh, of, of how to bring digitalization with the perspective using the structural issues. Uh, like for what we are in the Asia Pacific, some of us is thinking like, uh, uh, you know, IT for change and then uh, Nat Dano from the, uh, from the ETC group, right? We are actually come together and then we have like this different convenings that we are doing uh, from diverse movements. So one is that when we are doing the convening on the digitalization and labor rights, that, that time together also with IT for change. And then we talk about digitalization and food sovereignty in another convening with the farmers group and an indigenous peoples group. And then another time we also gather some of the di digital rights activists who usually talk about the issue of inclusion you know like and then and then giving more you know perspective from the structural issues right and then try to come up with some you know like kind of have level leveling up of understanding on how we look into the issue of digital rights but also digital justice right so how how is it and then what kind of strategy that we do i think that we have a lot of potential that we need to do this uh, and then and then have a more concrete step by step. And then I think in this forum, I, I totally agree with Nandini, like the despise girl and then the way that we also do this kind of, you know, uh, talk, you know, and then have that kind of connection. How, could, how to connect digitalization with climate justice issue, with economic justice issue is really, really important. Yeah. Over to you, Tetet and Amelia. Yeah, I just wanted to say that yesterday there was a consultation on the summit of the future, and I made an intervention rejecting pretty much all of it, and the Secretary General's proposals and the digital compact and whatever. <laughs> So, but but totally, there's there are so many tracks, including the the digital compact, and we wanted to invite actually Ned Daniel to this call. But uh, I think it was great to hear just from Nandini, and then in another session we should have Ned and uh, see all of these different uh, angles of the of the same global systemic issues. But from the, each of them play like a big role in the big puzzle, and we cannot forget it. And I agree totally with Nandini and Andrina in mobilizing movements and engaging more people into this. It seems very abstract, but in the end, it really impacts our daily life. I mean, just that Andrina gave all of these examples on, on going to the mall. Are you able to access or not? Is Rina is that now spending all of her money in a casino? We don't know. But that's for the enticement of the digital technology. So I think uh, this, these are very important questions to ask. 
Teta, tell us, are you spending all of your money in the casino? No, I, I always block, block, block. <laughs> That's my uh, knee-jerk reaction when I get all of these uh, annoying text messages, no? It's, it's so invasive, but it also gives you, you know, that feeling that, okay, there's a big brother there that's harvesting all of this data and using it for whatever purpose that would increase their private profits even more, no? So that's really, really dangerous and should be resisted. And um, for me personally, I would really like to thank uh, Nandini. Huge, huge thanks. Huge, huge hugs. No, this has been a most enlightening session. I think we have more questions in our mind as a result of what you gave us. I think it was just, you know, an installment. Our, uh, <laughs> it's an installment on our uh, uh, learning about all of these uh, interconnections in this uh, seemingly abstract and yet very concrete um, subject. No, So many thanks, Nandini, and I hope that um, we can invite you back again. I'm sure we have many more important, uh, you know, sub-issues that need to be unpacked. And of course, we invite you as an honorary despise girl. Yay. Always. <laughs> Yay. You have officially joined the Despise Girls Club. Our tribe is growing. <laughs> yes. All of the best in the CSW, Nandini. And just before we leave, we end up the session, just want to announce that we are ready with the following the episode three of the rise up series and now it will be all about uh, public services the importance of public services which is another angle uh fighting against privatization and so we're thinking that we will organize a virtual launch of the video next week february 23rd at 8 a.m um east time so it's the very same at the same time this this episode happened we will have that launch. It's going to be an amazing session that the, the Spice Girls will be there. We will have Lily Nactil with APMDD. We will have David Boyce with um, PSI. We will have um, MJ, Maria Jose uh, from Eurodad. We will have our, some of our artists and illustrators and people working on the creative side of the, of the, of the, um, the episode, which is, for I don't know, Nandini, if you've seen the Rise Up series, it is an animated video of 10 minutes from 10 to 12 minutes of uh, all of the activists fighting uh, against the the private sector takeover and the global north, etc. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, we have a series of two episodes already. One, what is which is caution, it's hold in here against climate change, and the other is. Uh, the world's mightiest heroes addressing the issue of care and pay domestic and care work. So now the third installment is about public services. So all of you will be very much welcome to that launch. And uh, yes, uh, many more exciting things to come. A launch so party. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nandini. All right. Thank you, Nandini. See you next Thank you, week. Nandete. Thank you, Denise, in the back. Ciao. Bye.